Welcome back, healthy people, to another episode of On Call with Dr. Randy. Today, we have Dr. Dallas Reed on the podcast today. How are you doing, Dr. Reed? I'm great. Thank you. Thank you for being on. So Dr. Reed is triple boarding. She's boarded in obstetrics, gynecology, genetics, and black girl magic. So we got somebody on <laughs> I was here. like, where's my third certification? <laughs> yes, yes, yes. I was you like, got oh, that. No, fr- I gave him wrong information. <laughs> <laughs> nah, you got that fresh out the womb. So we just gonna roll with it. You came out the womb. Perfect. One board already. <laughs> So today we're going to have a discussion on genetics. So we're going to talk about prenatal testing that women should get or people in relationships should get before having a pregnancy or maybe also during a pregnancy too as well. And having a little discussion on possible genetic testing that you may just want to get for yourself and understand some of your genetic risks that you may have. So before we kind of get that discussion going, tell us a little bit about your background. Sure. So um, I grew up, I I always like to talk about my name. So my first name is Dallas, which is a conversation starter. I was born in upstate New York, but I actually grew up outside of Dallas, Texas. So my whole like kindergarten through uh, high school education was in Plano, Texas, which is the biggest suburb of Dallas. Um, I went to college in uh, at an HBCU, Dillard University in New Orleans. And then I actually... um, had the opportunity to get accepted to Boston University School of Medicine early as a sophomore. They have an early medical school selection program with HBCUs. So I was accepted as a sophomore and then started there um, in a couple of the summers before my last year. And then my senior year, I was at BU for doing some undergrad classes and some med school classes. So um, there are these things called pathway programs that people should look into if they're not already in medicine and interested in medicine that are um, that are great ways to get into medical school. Um, and then I did my medical training at BU. I did a OBGYN residency in Connecticut at Bridgeport Hospital, which is part of the Yale uh, hospital system. And then I did a fellowship in medical genetics in New York at Mount Sinai. Um, And then ever since then, I have been in Boston at Tufts uh, Medical Center uh, doing my two practices. OBGYN is one practice and genetics is the other practice. And many times those two mix mix themselves together in my world. So um, that's a little bit about me professionally. Okay. So this is going to be a great interview because you're from Texas. So you have your Texas roots. (laughs) I am also from Texas. So shout out to my city. I'm from Port Arthur, Port Arthur, Texas. So okay. I, go, yeah. I, go, I go hang up in Dallas with some of my line brothers every now and then. So we go to Big T's Flea Market and go Very to the good. other um, places that we probably shouldn't hang out at. So uh, what, <laughs> not your personal hair though. <laughs> nah, nah, nah. So what made you have an interest in genetics? Yeah, so um, I'm asked this question a lot. I think that the... the thing about genetics in whatever part of genetics you're talking about, especially for people that go into medicine, is that usually they don't even know it's like a career choice, like an option for clinical medicine um, or research even. Um, But I had a very, very early experience, like many of us that go into medicine that get us interested in medical school and our medical practice. So when I was in first grade, my mom had a baby with a genetic condition. It was a surprise. We had no idea. She just like went and had to have the baby early. And had this condition. And, um, I was in first grade. And I think that was like, a really experience for me. When I was looking for what to do with my life. Job and I saw the sort of uh, inter, intersection with 
wasn't a thing. Like, there was a lot of resources that were talks about phenotype and genotype. We don't necessarily use those words, but we use other Mm -hmm. words to describe that. One thing that we are actually drawing is a pedigree, which is like the family tree. So it's the picture Mm -hmm. of the family tree. Um, So that is something that we actually draw out and like pen and paper and, you know, help try to understand what's going on in the family. But um, yeah, it's not as uh, scary as what you learn about in medical school. And, you know, I, I used to run the genetics course at Tufts University School of Medicine, Um, and our course was actually a very clinical course. So with students, like we were showing them how we use genetics every day in the office, like not research, not basic science, how I actually talk to patients and what tools we use and all those types of things. And I think, um, genetics in 2023 is like in everything. I mean, every type of doctor you see, sees people with genetic conditions is concerned about genetic conditions. I mean, we, we just went through COVID. COVID, we talked about genetic mutations on the news all the time. So genetics is everywhere and everything. And the more people understand about it, the better um, I think all of our understanding will be. So you talked about just now about family tree, which is very important in genetics. So how is it important that people actually know their family tree and also what kind of conditions that people have had in the past to help you better help them? Yeah, so it is a really important thing is to try to understand um, if there are medical issues in your family and get as many specific details as possible. From our perspective, it sort of depends on the, the, the reason for the appointment. So we see patients for all kinds of indications. A lot of what we see are people with a personal or family history of cancer. And so family history becomes really important in that sense. A lot of times because even just insurance approval for testing depends on what the patient's family history is. 
Um, in other things like in pediatrics, uh, asking things about developmental delay and autism and learning disabilities and um, understanding if you have a cousin that has some medical issue that they were born with that makes them, you know, a little bit different than the rest of their family, like trying to get as much information as possible is really helpful. It's obviously challenging. People may not know their family members. People may not know like a whole side of their family because they're estranged from that side of the family. People may not talk about medical issues in their family. This is especially true when we talk about cancer and especially breast cancer and female cancers, quote unquote. Um, there can be a lot of limited information. And for me, like if you tell me my family member had a stomach cancer, is that the stomach? Is that the abdomen? Is that the colon? Is that the uterus? Is that the ovary? Like it actually makes a big difference from my perspective about what risks am I worried about for you? Because everything is not the same risk. So trying to get as much information as possible is very helpful, but we do what we can and we try not to make people feel bad about not knowing some of that information. We also try to give them some questions to ask family members if they do identify someone that could answer the question better. So things, especially in cancer, things like, you know, let us know like what age they were diagnosed, what kind of treatment they had. Did they have surgery? Did they have chemotherapy? Did they have radiation? Um, and did they have genetic testing? Because now, you know, genetic testing for cancer in particular has been available for 10 years or so. So they may have had genetic testing and that's a really good question to ask and know about for, for us to decide what to do with that patient going forward. So um, we can kind of help guide what you should ask and it's okay to come back to us and say, I got an update from the family history about what I need to know or what you need to know. Um, but trying to get information beforehand, especially focus on the reason that you're coming to see genetics or your doctor is really, really helpful. Okay. So like, who are the typical people that come to see you? Is it couples? Is it single individuals, people part of the LGBTQ community? As far as like prenatal testing, who usually comes into your office? Sure. So my practice is sort of uh, two pronged. Um, so I have genetic stuff that I do in OBGYN, and that's mostly around like what you're describing, preconception genetic testing. And I'll talk about what that is in a minute or prenatal testing, like in a pregnancy. And then the other part of my job is what we call clinical genetics or general genetics, which is cancer, pediatrics, things like hearing loss, seizure disorders, autism, heart issues, like for children and adults. So that's kind of a separate practice that I have in, at Tufts. Um, but for the prenatal setting, there's sort of two types of genetic testing. So one is called preconception testing, and that's where people come to talk to their doctor, it does not have to be a geneticist, it could be their OBGYN or primary care doctor, about any um, family history of any genetic conditions that they have that may run in the family, or to do just screening for diseases that are out there that are genetic that they could be what we call a carrier for, meaning they could have a genetic mutation for that condition and they themselves don't have the condition, but if their partner also has a genetic mutation for the same condition, there's a chance they could have a child with that condition. Ideally, something like that happens before pregnancy, right? That way you have the most options as far as what to do going forward if you find out you and your partner are carriers for the same condition. Uh, but oftentimes pregnancies are not planned. Um, so mm -hmm. sometimes that testing happens at the very beginning of pregnancy. And so it's important to have that testing as early in pregnancy as possible, again, to give you as, mon as many options as, as possible. Um, so that's what we call carrier screening, where we're sort of seeing if you are a carrier for any genetic conditions. The other part of what I do in, in OBGYN is patients who come in who maybe have already had that testing, everything was fine, they come in for an ultrasound and they find a, a problem with the fetus. There's a brain abnormality, there's a missing hand, there's a kidney problem, you know, things like that, heart defect. Um, then they may see genetics to talk about, well, what gen could this be a genetic condition? What condition could it be? What are my options to figure it out now or after the baby's born? And so we kind of talk through that and, and what their options are there. So it's one thing is like for everybody, the carrier screening is something that we recommend for everybody. 
the other piece is uh, more for people who come in and there's something that we see on ultrasound that's abnormal. Okay. So let's give like a little scenario. So let's just say I come in with my spouse. Let's just throw them. My spouse is Megan Good. I'm coming in with Megan Good. She's left Jonathan Major. Okay. She stepped up to someone else with a doctorate degree. Like, hey, I okay. thought you had some problems. So she's with me now. So <laughs> we're coming in together for some preconception testing. And we're trying to do mm-hmm. some carrier screening. So what are some of the things that we're both going to be screened for? Is it going to be like sickle cell or something else on the, on the plate? Or yeah. what are the typical screening tests? So uh, before that appointment, you and Megan should talk to your families <laughs> and find out if there's anybody in the family with a genetic condition or with a problem that they were born with. So things like hearing loss or a heart defect that needed surgery or somebody that was born with one kidney or anybody with autism or learning disabilities, because those are questions we would ask. The other question we ask often is about anybody in the family with multiple miscarriages, like more than three miscarriages in for one individual. So things like that can perhaps point us in the direction of possible genetic conditions and something that we'd want to talk about. If none of those things were the case, both of you had really healthy families, you know, neither of you had children, other children with any genetic conditions. Um, then in a preconception setting, what we talk about is this carrier screening. The recommendations have changed over the last few years. It used to be very narrow where we only tested for certain things based on your ethnic background. Um, but that has changed in recent years. And um, because we know that people often don't know their ethnic background, there's a lot of mixed ethnic backgrounds. And it wasn't um, an approach that was very um, equitable. There has Mm -hmm. been sort of a shift in the field to do a a larger set of conditions for carrier screening. So now the American College of Medical Genetics has come out with a list of about 115 conditions that they recommend people be screened for um, in the preconception or early pregnancy period. Um, So that in a preconception setting can be done one of two ways. One is either we just screen the person that's going to be pregnant um, and see if they're a carrier for any of those conditions. And if they are, then we can then screen their partner or we can screen both of the people at the same time. Typically, it's either a blood test or like a saliva or a cheek swab sample. um, And those results usually take about two weeks to come back. If uh, we find out that um, you know, the pregnant, the person that's going to be pregnant is a carrier and we haven't tested their partner, then we can test their partner for that condition. Or um, if they both were tested at the same time and we find out they're carriers for the same condition, then there's subsequent discussions with usually genetics involved at that point. Before that, you don't need to see genetics. Your doctor can deal with that. Your like primary care doctor, OBGYN. Um, And then you would meet with what's called a genetic counselor usually. So those are actually not doctors. They're masters trained individuals that work with a high risk obstetrics doctor or a genetics doctor um, to talk to you about what are your options. And now we're both carriers for this. What do we do? What what options do we have? Um, and, And try to get a little bit from both of you about what are your feelings about this condition? Like, what is the condition? Like we explain what it is because for some conditions, some people may not care that much. They may say, that's fine. I'm fine with having a child with that condition. It doesn't bother me. For other people, they may not feel that way. Um, So what is the condition? How do you feel about knowing you could have a child with that condition? What is the chance? Usually it's a 25% chance um, in every pregnancy that the two of you together could have a child with that condition. What are the, what is the benefit of knowing that before delivery? Uh, Mm -hmm. what is the benefit of not knowing and just knowing after? Um, And then what are your options in pregnancy? Things like in vitro fertilization and reproductive technologies to help you become pregnant versus just getting pregnant on your own versus, you know, what if you find out you have a child with that condition during the pregnancy and want to have a termination of pregnancy? So we kind of go through the gamut of options. Um, And then you, you know, in the preconception setting, you have time to think about that and figure out sort of how you want to approach it. It doesn't mean that you have to have any answers at the end of that counseling session. Um, but that's kind of what we would do and how we would approach it. 
Okay. I mean, that was a good explanation right there. So let's just say me and Megan both test positive for sickle cell. Um, are there any mm-hmm. type of things as far as treatments that can be done? I know sometimes people think, well, can we find the egg that doesn't maybe have this and certain things like that? So we yeah. can create the ba- Yeah. So genetics is evolving in the sense that we are coming up with more and more. Well, those are things that we call um, gene therapies. So there's sort of two prongs to gene therapy. One is somebody already has the condition and we have a treatment that targets their actual genetic mutation, which is not how most like medications and things work these days, but more and more things are, are being developed like that. And then there's the, the hope that we want, which is that we can actually go in and like change the genetic information in the sperm, the egg, the embryo, so that the person doesn't even have that condition. And we're not there yet with mm-hmm. uh, affecting like the sperm, the egg, or the embryo. We are we are developing more therapies for people that we know have a genetic condition. So for sickle cell, there's not treatments available, but there mm-hmm. are reproductive options available. And that's where that in, um, in vitro fertilization comes in. So what that is, IVF, people have probably heard of it, is where you put the sperm and the egg together in a lab, basically. You let it grow for a couple days until there's a, you know several hundred cells. And then the lab takes a couple of those cells and actually does some genetic testing on those cells to see if that embryo does or does not have sickle cell or whatever genetic condition you're, you're testing for. And so you can do that process and make many embryos, test many embryos, and then you have a cohort of embryos that have the genetic condition and a cohort of embryos that do not. And you can freeze them and use them for pregnancies going forward. They're sort of frozen in time. So we're not, we haven't even gotten into talking about like advanced maternal age and egg quality and things like that that change over the reproductive lifetime. But um, it does allow you to sort of get a bunch of embryos at one time that you can save and use for pregnancies as time goes on. So that is the benefit of doing preconception testing is that you have that option. Obviously, once you're pregnant, you're pregnant and, you know, it's the embryo is already now a fetus and there's not much you Mm -hmm. can do about choosing. um, But there are other options available like testing during the pregnancy to find out if the fetus does or does not have the condition and making decisions based on that. Okay. So speaking of testing during the pregnancy, me and Megan come back in. It's like, oh, we got her pregnant. Yay. Go me. Go Megan. (laughs) But we saw on the ultrasound that it looks like there's something wrong with the baby. And like, let's just say it's apparent there's a cleft lip um, going on that was noticed on ultrasound. What is usually the process of genetic uh, testing during a pregnancy? Yeah, so um, it depends on where you are. You may see just like a specialist in obstetrics or you may see a genetic counselor or geneticist. Um, But typically once a difference is found on an ultrasound, either that day or as soon as possible, they would have you speak with the specialist to talk about, again, your family histories. Does anybody else in the family have a cleft Mm -hmm. lip or cleft palate? You know, get this full family history to figure out, is this... Could this be a genetic condition that runs in the family or is this just something that happened new in this fetus? Um, And then they talk to you about your options. So sometimes depending on the difference, there are like some genetic conditions that we know that might be associated with those. And so there might be a particular set of tests that, that are recommended. Sometimes, especially if there's multiple differences, like a cleft lip and a brain difference and a problem with one of the kidneys and a a club foot or a foot that's turned in. We call those syndromic findings and there might be like a bigger set of tests that are available. But essentially, depending on how far along the pregnancy is, um, usually if you're seeing a cleft lip, you're farther along than some of the other abnormalities that we can identify. Um, They'll talk to you about tests that can be done to figure out if there's a genetic problem happening or not. Sometimes people don't want to do those tests. They involve a needle in the um, getting, you know, either a sample of the placenta or a sample of the fluid around the baby to test that for genetics. Um, Mm -hmm. That has a risk. There's a risk of miscarriage. The risk is low, but there's a risk with those procedures. So sometimes people don't want to do them. 
Um, they also sometimes are not that concerned, like a cleft lip may not concern somebody a couple very much. And they may say, that's fine. You know, we'll just get that corrected when the child is born. And I don't want to do any genetic testing for that. Um, and also it may not be genetic. The genetics may come back normal and, you know, we may not know. I think the other thing is genetic testing in that setting. We don't, it's not like we're testing for every possible genetic condition out there. So even though people go through a lot, let's say they do one of those needle tests and it comes back normal, that is reassuring, but it's not, it's not saying we've ruled out everything that could possibly be related to this cleft lip. So that's, the, that's why having a discussion with a genetics person, a prenatal genetic counselor or a geneticist is really important so that you're understanding, first of all, what is the procedure? What are the risks and benefits of the procedure? What is this thing? What could it be? Like, how concerned do I feel about what it could be? And what um, could we get from the testing? And what, what may still be questions after we do the testing? So all of those things are really important to talk about before you do the testing, because it would be a shame for you to go through a procedure, get a, get a test that comes back normal, and then later we find out your child still has a genetic condition, and it, you were never told that. You were never told that that was a possibility. You felt like it was a yes or a no, 100% chance that we've ruled everything out. You know, that would be really unfortunate and happens all the time because people aren't always um, don't always have access to all of this counseling, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. So who are some of those people that are, have limited access to these genetic testing? Is it people in rural communities, people of color, low income? I, I think that, um, you know, there's not a lot of geneticists and genetic counselors, like we usually work together. I think there's probably people that actually do clinical genetics, so see patients, don't work in a laboratory, don't just do research with genetics. There's probably a couple thousand geneticists in the country. Um, and mm -hmm. somebody like me that does obstetrics and genetics, it's even less. You know, I'm talking about a few hundred people. So, you know, we are not everywhere. And usually uh, an OBGYN practice has some way of making sure they have these discussions or the opportunity for people to have these discussions. Maybe it's not with a geneticist, maybe it's with a high risk obstetric specialist, but certainly if you have to go far to get your obstetric care, which we know is becoming more and more of an issue with closing down certain um, obstetric uh, hospitals and providers, that's an issue. Um, if English isn't your first language, um, that may be challenging. You know, we know there's all kinds of bias mm -hmm. in healthcare, so you may not be referred. They may not think you'll understand. They may not explain everything to you. They may not use an interpreter because you understand a little bit of English. You know, things like that that are just a problem throughout medicine are, are even more amplified in this type of a setting when we're talking about things that are really complicated and really emotionally, you know, driven. Like you're talking about your unborn child here. Um, and, you know, decisions can be clouded and things can be clouded in, the, in that type of a setting. It can be really hard to make decisions. So I think all of the areas in other parts of healthcare in which there is um, issues with getting access to care is definitely true in this area. Um, and maybe even more in obstetrics because we know that there are, there are places in which it, you, you have to go hours and hours and way to get obstetric care. So I'm going to ask you a question. It's a little bit out of left field, but like as we're talking, my wheels are turning in my brain. So it's been a lot going on with women's rights and certain things that the government are doing. So have you seen this affect your practice and affect how you treat, uh, or I don't want to say treat, but medicine in general for women? Like if someone's having genetic testing and seeing that they have a child who may have some kind of genetic abnormality, they may not be able to terminate pregnancies in certain areas. Right. So how have you seen that affect women? Yeah, so I'm in Massachusetts, which is a state that protects women's right to have abortions. Um, so there hasn't so far been a very big impact in our clinical practice. We do have some people that come from out of state and things like that because um, what the state that they live in doesn't have 
the, the, those same rights. Um, so we're lucky in Massachusetts. Um, but in the field in general, I mean, there's a million questions about how this is going to affect things from a genetics perspective, even starting as early as that IVF process I talked about. So people who have embryos that have genetic mutations, you know, because there's so much debate about it's, it's not a medical debate, it's a political debate about when life starts, right? At how early is it that life starts? So there, if some interpret that in a very, very strict way in which once the sperm and egg come together, that is when life starts, then there are people that have frozen embryos that they don't want to use. Are they going to get you know convicted of murder because they choose to discard embryos that, that are genetically mutated that they aren't going to use? You know, it starts as early as that. Um, so will people decide that they don't want to do that type of testing because they don't want to get in trouble and get, you know, le have legal ramifications? Or are there doctors that are not going to do that testing because of those legal ramifications? And then, you know, it goes up through the pregnancy. I mean, there are some genetic conditions that even if you had an ultrasound every day would not present themselves until after what we call viability, which is the gestational age at which a fetus could survive outside of the, the pregnant person. So there are some conditions in which you don't see anything until 30 weeks of pregnancy. Uh, and they can be really, really serious problems that can cause life limiting um, effects for the fetus, or it can be detrimental to the, to the pregnant person. And so that is devastating to be in a place where you can't make the decision that you want to make for your family because of a political decision is uh, really challenging and really, you know, some of the hard discussions that we will have to have with patients because um, as a field, you know, that we'll have to have with patients as a field. Yeah. It's a very heavy topic right there. I mean, we could be sitting here talking about that for like hours, but I mean, I know it's, it's a, yeah, it's, it's an unfortunate part that women have to go through. So let's just say someone has a child and there's a genetic abnormality found after the child is born. So is there some kind of post-pregnancy genetic testing that is done sometime if a woman has like a stillborn child or some other kind of abnormality that happens. Yeah, so you're sort of there's sort of two things that can happen in this sense. So sometimes uh, people have a very normal pregnancy and then they have what's called a stillbirth. So they come in for an appointment, there's no heartbeat, and they're very advanced in the pregnancy. Nothing else has been wrong. There were no ultrasound problems. None of the other tests that we do early in pregnancy were abnormal. Um, we, we do offer genetic testing for those individuals. It's, it's, um, depends on where you are, what is offered. It's kind of broad and nonspecific and a very, you know, few cases will identify a genetic cause. There could be other causes that are not genetic infections, placental issues, uh, you know, things like that, that may, we may never know. Uh, the more common scenario is that you have a baby that's born and there's something different about the baby. They didn't see the cleft lip on ultrasound and now we see it. Uh, the baby has, um, you know, is turning blue and they do a ultrasound of the heart and they identify that there's a heart defect, you know, things like that. So I often get pulled into that in my other part of my work. Um, on the inpatient side, we get consultations from the the newborn nursery and the NICU for babies that are born with differences. And sometimes we know about them before birth and sometimes we just know about them after. And we get involved to sort of help figure out, do a very detailed exam. We call it a dysmorphology exam to look at things in lots of detail. How far apart are the eyes? Are the ears low set or not? Are the creases on the hand normal? You know, all these really detailed things to try to figure out, could this be genetic? or could it not be genetic? And if we think that it might be genetic, then we would talk to the, the family about some possible things it could be, what some of the genetic uh, testing options are, um, and kind of go from there. So there is genetic testing that can be done afterwards. Um, sometimes it's hard to know right away in a newborn baby 
even if you do some genetic testings, if it's genetic or not. So oftentimes we follow kids in genetics clinic as they get bigger, because other things may mm -hmm. pop up, other medical problems, they may have developmental problems or things like that that may pop up over time um, that help us make a diagnosis. In, in a setting like that, being a geneticist is like being a detective. Like we're trying to put these little clues together. What do we see on physical exam? What medical problems do they have? you know, what's going on with their learning and development to try to figure out, you know, what the cause of it is. And so sometimes all of those things are just not apparent in a two-day-old newborn in the NICU, and you need the the advantage of time to see if things are changing or not changing. So, so we kind of put a bow on this topic and move on to cancer. Any words of wisdom, sure. advice that you would want to give to people who are considering having um, prenatal genetic testing or pregnant right now and thinking about getting genetic testing done? Uh, one of the topics we didn't talk about, well, I would say two things. One is I would prioritize this testing before you get pregnant over when you are pregnant. So, you know, if you're thinking of having a child in the next couple years, even if you don't have a partner right now, you can still do carrier screening. And so it's something you should talk to your doctor about. Um, the second thing that we didn't really touch on is there's other genetic testing that's done early in pregnancy. You can't do it before, but early in pregnancy for things like Down syndrome and other genetic conditions, that's called cell-free DNA testing. And it's something that if you are pregnant or are planning to become pregnant, you should talk to your doctor about so that you um, have an idea about what it is and what it's screening for um, and making sure that you're getting, you know, that testing if you want it. Um, and the third thing would be, you know, just talk to your family about family history. Anybody with something weird or, uh, you know, that, that you had heard about, you know, try to get as much information about it as possible before you go see your doctor. And the fourth thing that I forgot to ask you about, costs. Is this out of pocket yeah. to have some of this done or does insurance cover some of this? It depends on your insurance. It depends on what it is. Um, many of the laboratories for some of the more routine tests like carrier screening, like the cell-free DNA testing, um, often have very, what I consider, what most of us consider very favorable pricing. So either it's covered by your insurance or um, they can, they can do what's called a cash price, where it's like $200, $250, $300 out of pocket for the testing versus like the $1,500, $2,000, $5,000 that might be charged to your insurance. So comparing the cost to that, it's, it's relatively affordable. Obviously, there's still people that can't afford that. Um, oftentimes, the laboratories also have... Um, have it so that patients who have like a Medicaid insurance, so a state insurance, they don't pay anything out of pocket. So if the insurance covers it, great. If they don't cover it, that's okay. They still won't charge them anything out of pocket. So it's a good question to ask your doctor. They should know the answer to that. Or you can usually talk directly to the laboratory that's going to be doing your testing and your doctor can tell you what the laboratory is. For some of the other testing that's done in pregnancies, like if we find something abnormal on an ultrasound and we want to do testing based on that needle test, those are much more variably covered. And in some places they're not covered at all. And it's several thousands of dollars. Um, in some places it's completely covered by your insurance. So it really just depends on what specific test. And usually your doctor's office or the prenatal genetic counselor is getting something called a prior authorization for that testing. So it's a process like they have to see if it can even be covered um, before you do the procedure. So that one is a little bit more challenging. And the same goes for after, you know, testing that we do in babies and children. It's also very variable if it's covered or not covered. But I will say the benefit of seeing a geneticist and a genetic counselor is that we actually have that discussion with you before we do any testing. We usually know what insurance you have, what laboratory we're doing, we're using, what their policy is on billing. And we will talk to you about that before you do the testing and what, what do we do if it ends up being really expensive? So like what our options are there. Okay, so that's some good information on that because I know someone out there is worried about potentially having a bill in the mail or trying to pick yes. and choose what type of testing that they're gonna get just based upon cost. So we're gonna switch yeah. subjects a little bit. So we're going to go from genetics to something even simpler. 
Cancer. Yes, that's 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 not as simple as genetics at all. Not as simple, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so another complicated topic. So how do you explain cancer to your patients? Like every a lot of people like when they hear cancer, it's like ah, they know it's bad for the most part. Yeah. But how do you break it down into layman's terms? Yeah. So cancer and the cancer genetics part of my job, like I said earlier, I see patients either with just a family history of cancer or with a personal history. And oftentimes it's a very, it's a new diagnosis. So they saw their, they had a mammogram, there was something that was found, they had a biopsy, they got the results of the biopsy yesterday that says it's cancer. And they've seen the oncologist, the surgeon, and now they're seeing us. So it's a lot of information all at once, like, bing, bang, boom, you like haven't even like dealt with the fact that someone said you had cancer, like you're still in shock. Um, mm -hmm. So it can be a really challenging time to have these conversations. And our appointments are long. We're, and we're getting into family history again, but you may or may not have that information, but that can be really helpful for us. Um, we're talking about genetics, which is you're like, I don't even, what are you talking about? I just was told I have cancer. Um, but we try to talk about you know, most cancers are not genetic. Most cancers are what we call sporadic. They happen by chance. 90% of the time, that's what happens. About 10% of the time, someone has a genetic mutation in a gene that um, can increase their risk of developing cancer in their lifetime. And that is why things like what age they are, what type of cancer is helpful for us to know, as well as family history. Were there other people in the family that had that cancer? Did they have that cancer at a young age? Um, did they have the in breast cancer, for example, did they have it on both breasts or was it just one breast? Like things like that can help us sort of risk stratify. Is this person high risk or not high risk based on that history? Um, and then and then we talk to them about doing, you know, doing the testing and figuring out if it is genetic or not genetic. If it is genetic, that could actually impact their treatment, especially when it comes to tr uh, surgery or especially in breast cancer or other medication treatment, having the genetic mutation can actually uh, make a difference. Um, so it's important to have those discussions before the treatment, You know, if, you're, if your doctor says it may or may not change your treatment. So I'm primary care. So one of the issues that I kind of run into is that when patients come to see me, they'll say, hey, Dr. Randy, I'm like, what's up? What's going on? I want to get tested for cancer. Like, which cancer? All of them. I'm like, yeah, there, there's there's not a specific what? test for all the cancers. Right. And so how do you kind so of counsel what people? What do you do in that situation? Mm hmm. So what I, what I would say is, you're right, there is not a test for all the cancers. And the way at this moment that we recommend um, approaching that is to find out their family history. So if they have a strong family history of cancer, um, then you as their primary care doctor should refer them to genetics to talk about that history and determine if they do or don't meet criteria for testing, you know, what genetic conditions are we concerned about? Um, things like that. That would be the best option. So that person needs to find out their family history, as much detail as they can, you know, what cancers, what age of diagnosis, who is it in the family? Like sometimes people say, is my, it was my, uh, my cousin. I'm like, okay, your cousin on your mom's side or your dad's side. Well, it's just my cousin. I'm like, I need to know <laughs> more details. <laughs> so, so try to get as much info as possible. And if they have uh, you know, multiple people with cancer or people with cancer at a young age or um, very aggressive cancers, then seeing a genetics professional is the best next step to figure out if they meet criteria for testing, if they should have testing, you know, things like that. So if you could just kind of expand upon guidelines that we kind of talk to patients about and order certain tests because certain times I run into problems as far as, like I just mentioned, people want to get tested for all type of cancer or they've got one family member who had pancreatic cancer that we know is usually like in the late stages when it's found, but there's no kind of screening yeah. guidelines on screening for that type of thing. 
Yeah. So part of what we do in our session, so there's usually what we call a pre-test counseling session. So before we do the testing and then a post-test counseling session after we do the testing. In the pre-test counseling session, we usually talk about, you know, based on the family history and personal history, there might be a particular genetic condition that we have a little bit of concern about. And so we actually spend some time talking about that. So you tell me like, all of your aunts on your mom's side had breast cancer and your grandmother had ovarian cancer on your mom's side. I'm concerned about the BRCA1 and 2 mutations or the BRCA mutations are what they are called sometimes. So I'm going to talk to you about that in my preconception testing setting. I'm going to say, what is BRCA? You know, what are those genes? What cancers are associated with them? How high is the cancer risk if somebody is positive? And if someone's positive, what do we do about that? How do we screen them? Are there surgical options we recommend? You know, just so you know that like, if you're positive and you're a person who has ovaries, I may be telling you, you should have your ovaries removed. You may not be coming into that session thinking that I'm going to recommend you having a body part removed if you come back positive. So it's helpful for you to know that before we do the testing, right? Um, And then in the post-test session, you know, the testing that we do, let's say that was the family history that the person came to me with. We don't just test for the BRCA mutations. There's actually a many, many more genes that we test for. And the testing now is very broad. So we wouldn't even just focus on like a breast cancer history. We would test for colon genes and pancreatic genes and, you know, all kinds of other things. Um, So if you come back positive for something else, let's say it's not BRCA, then we have another discussion about what is this gene? What cancers are associated with it? How high is the chance? And we have that whole discussion again. So you're right. In general, for breast cancer genes, uh, we recommend, you know, breast exams and being aware of your own breast tissue, um, earlier mammograms and breast MRIs typically, and pos- the possibility of having what we call risk-reducing double mastectomy, so a surgery to remove all of the breast tissue um, before cancer develops. So depending on the, the gene, that may be a recommendation. For ovarian cancer, um, because it's similar to pancreatic cancer, usually very aggressive when it's diagnosed. There is no screening test for it. We typically recommend removing the tubes and ovaries. And the age at which we recommend that depends on the gene. Things like colon cancer, we recommend um, earlier colonoscopies and more frequent colonoscopies. Again, depending on the gene, depends on how early and how frequent. The most frequent we recommend is every one to two years for some of the genetic conditions. And the like the lower end would be like every five years, depending on what condition we're talking about. Um, And then things like pancreatic cancer are really challenging because we don't have screening for them. We can't just remove your pancreas like we can with the ovaries. Um, And so that usually you need to be in a place where there's a research study going on, looking at screening for pancreatic cancer We usually are more concerned about people who have a genetic mutation in a gene that causes pancreatic cancer and a family history of pancreatic cancer. That person is is very high risk. And, you know, we should try to figure out some, you know, an expert that they can see to talk to about that risk and what options are available for screening. Um, So that is in general what the recommendations are, but obviously it can get more specific depending on the actual results. So let's just say someone comes to see you and they're not ready to have surgery as of yet, right? They're not at that stage in their life where like, okay, I understand my wrist, and, but I'm, I'm not ready to have my yeah. wrist removed or my ovaries removed. Is there something else that they can do to lower their cancer risk? Because there's the big wave of taking these supplements or taking herbs or certain things that they should do with their diet to decrease a person's potential chances of developing cancer. Yeah. Um, I'll say, just in case we don't get to this, um, in that preconception counseling appointment, if someone, after hearing all the information, decides they don't want testing, they don't know if they want testing, they want to think about it, they want to get more family history, that's totally fine. The point of those sessions is not to convince you to do genetic testing. The point of that session is to give you the information so you can make an informed decision about if you want to do it or not. So we have people that that walk away from that and say, even if they just were diagnosed with cancer, this happens where they say, I don't think I want to do this or I want to do it later or, 
you know, they have many, many reasons why it, it, it may not be the best time for them. So I want people to feel empowered to say like, thank you for the information. This is not something I'm going to do today. Um, but in regards to post-test counseling, you know, figuring out that they actually do have a high risk and there are some recommendations for them. It depends on what it is. For ovarian cancer, because some people may be positive, you know, before they're done having children, for example, and you need your ovaries if you're going to um, become pregnant on your own or naturally or even use in vitro fertilization with your own eggs. So in those cases, there are things that can help. Um, and the studies have been done to look at birth control, actually. So oral contraceptive pills in particular, but probably other forms of birth control that suppress ovulation can actually be protective of, against developing ovarian cancer. So that's one thing, like, but when you're not trying to become pregnant to be on some type of birth control, that's hormonal. And then when you do want to become pregnant, you're off of that and, you know, just go back on it when you're, after you um, have your baby. That's one thing. Um, for, for, in general, you know, we talk about not smoking. Obviously, smoking is a huge risk factor for cancer. Um, having a healthy diet and exercising is important for everything that we do. Um, but as far as like, you know, I don't make recommendations about you need to take a certain supplement or do this or do that. It's more about trying to, you know, stay as healthy as possible um, and not sm smoke and drink all day and, you know, these types of things. For breast cancer, there's not a lot to prevent the cancer from happening. Um, for some people that are very high risk, there are there's a medication called tamoxifen or medications like it that are available to help decrease your risk of developing cancer. But that's a very individual discussion based on your your actual percentage risk, and you should talk to a specialist about that. But in general, it's more about you know trying to have a healthy lifestyle and, and talk to your doctor about. You know, is there a way to, my, I have a strong family history of this. I don't want to have my ovaries out yet because I want to have kids. Is there something I can do to help decrease my risk? Another good preventative measure is wearing sunscreen for those who had increased risk yes. of getting sun cancer. So that's something simple. I've been trying to do better with that myself. Um, but I don't know if taking a bath or drinking alkaline water is going to prevent you from getting cancer or <laughs> right. drinking sea, sea moss and all of that. And I, 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 we, we don't know offhand if that's going to... We don't know. Uh, yeah, yeah. So more research <laughs> needs to be done on that front. Um, do you think some cancers can be prevented um, earlier if people saw more genetic specialists like yourself? Absolutely. Um you know, the more people are asked these questions, will ask questions of their family so that they know if there's a family history, you know, go to their doctor and give that good information about if there's a family history or not. So their doctor knows that they need to see a specialist or be referred. Um, and the more people decide to do this testing before they develop any cancer, you know, the more opportunity we have either to prevent the cancer from happening altogether um, in, you know, by removing that organ, if that's an option or picking it up earlier. So for example, you know, if we know that you're at risk of developing a colon cancer, instead of starting colon cancer screening at, I, I think they just said 40, right? 40 is the age 40, that people should start. 45. Doing. 45. If the mammograms mm -hmm. was 40, 45, mm -hmm. um, you know, it may be that you need to start screening in your thirties. Um, and mm -hmm. you know, we could, we could pick up an early colon cancer in your thirties and treat that and you not have, you know, an advanced stage cancer or, um, the other sequelae from that, um, you know, that definitely can save lives. Um, so you know, we actually at Tufts, we rolled out a, a project with our OBGYN clinic in which, because typically what would happen before is the OBGYN would have to identify that history, then refer them to the genetics department. They would see us in genetics. We would do that discussion, do the testing, go from there. Um, and we started a program in 2022 where we actually have the patient fill out a questionnaire before they come in. It gives them some education about genetics if they do meet criteria for genetic testing. And when they come in for the um, OBGYN appointment, they can do the testing right there. And if it is positive, then the genetics department follows up with them at that point. And the difference in the number of people that have been screened 
who have had these questions asked and determine if they do or don't meet criteria are massive, you know, like massive difference in the number of people that are actually getting this type of discussion happening. Um, and the very first person that we had that came back positive on their genetic testing had a family history, very strong family history of colon cancer, um, had brought it up to their doctors multiple times. No one had ever referred this patient to genetics. And she was positive for something that requires her to get colonoscopies really early. Um, mm -hmm. So we have, and, and that condition also can cause ovarian cancer. So we mm -hmm. have possibly saved her life, saved her from developing a cancer by doing something like this and not, um, you know, pushing this out any farther or, or having her go through the hurdle of actually being referred to genetics, waiting for that appointment. Cause again, there's not many of us, it takes a long time to get an appointment and then doing the testing at that point. Okay. So as we wrap up this conversation on cancer, any particular words of wisdom that you want to leave for my healthy listeners in regard to cancer testing? Um, again, family history is important. And um, I would also say, you know, sometimes when you, sometimes you're not the best person, especially if you're, if you haven't had cancer, but let's say your mom had a cancer at a young age, she may, and she's a, she's alive and available to do testing. She may be the better person to test, to help give us what's called an informative um of in, informative results. So sometimes the asymptomatic person without cancer is not the best person. So that's one thing. Again, family history is important. And um, if you have been diagnosed with cancer, you should talk to your doctor about genetic testing because um, again, another place where there's bias in medicine when it comes to who's being referred to genetics and who isn't. People of color have a are less likely to be referred therefore less likely to get this testing done. Um, so you should definitely bring it up if they don't bring it up to you. And also get you a good primary care physician if you don't have one already. Um, that's usually kind of where the ball starts to get rolling um, when we yeah. have simple conversations as, what is your family tree? Like I always make sure I ask them about that. Don't come and see me. I'm full already. You can't see me until like November <laughs> or December. It's a long wait to see Dr. Randy. So you, you got to have to search for somebody else. So I always like to end my podcast with Randy's random questions. Are you ready, Dr. Reed? Ready. All right. So question number one, what do you love that's so specific for Dallas, Texas? in the Dallas area. Oh, Dallas is known for a lot of things that are very specific. It can be hairstyles. It can be leather shorts. <laughs> it could be restaurants <laughs> that are specific. It, it's a lot, uh, D town boogie. What, what do you love that's specific for Dallas? Um, I would say the food. Well, well, actually that's not true. I can't believe I didn't say this first. I would say the Cowboys. Like I'm a massive Cowboys fan. Okay, you can't. All right, what's wrong? Go ahead. You can't be a Talk Texas about you. for the Cowboys. I'm a huge I Cowboys fan. You know, despite the craziness they put us through every season, but I would say the sports teams, the Cowboys, and I'm a Mavs fan. I'm in Boston now, so I'm a Celtics fan as well. Mm -hmm. Go to all the games, but um, I do love love the Mavs and the Rangers. So I'd say the sports. I'm a big fan. Okay. Man, Jerry going to give y'all a heart attack every year, and y'all going to fall in love every with year. the team again. <laughs> y'all love that drama. So question number <laughs> two, why did you go to an HBCU? Uh, that's a great question. So I grew up in Plano, which is like middle class, uh, city. Um, my high school was like the more diverse high school, but still majority white. I was in like at the international baccalaureate program. So like the super nerd classes, uh, where there was like maybe one other black student in those, um, especially towards like the last couple of years of high school. Um, and I just wanted a different experience. I didn't even know about HBCUs until like maybe my 
sophomore year and my aunt and uncle used to do or still do a college tour every year through their church. Um, and they would go, it was an HBCU college tour and they would go either, they lived in North Carolina, so they would go North one year and then the next year go South. They both went to FAMU, they're huge FAMU um, mm-hmm. alumni. FAMU people are worse than Cowboys fans, I think personally. <laughs> the, the, <laughs> they're they're just like intense. <laughs> <laughs> Those rattlers. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So my aunt actually was like, if you want to be a doctor, you should go to Xavier. And so I was just applying to multiple colleges. Dillard was also in New Orleans and applied to both of them. And when I went on college tours, I just really liked Dillard better. Um, and wasn't, wasn't also a big fan of the lack of scholarship opportunities I got from Xavier. Um, Mm -hmm. so it, it actually was really a fortuitous choice because I won that early medical school selection program I talked about was only with, I mean, there's other schools, but Dillard was the one in new Orleans that, that they are associated with. So that's how I got to medical school is through this program. Um, I also happened to have some really awesome mentors when I was there and I studied abroad my junior year in London through a scholarship called the Luard scholarship. So I had my entire year paid for, um, in London and, you know, I think got some really great opportunities by going to an HBCU that I might not have gotten going somewhere else. And it also, you know, um, I don't know if you went to an HBCU, but there's also just some life skills that you learn with, uh, being at an HBCU and managing your own education and your own sort of bureaucratic life uh, that, you know, I think are like really important skills to have. Cause when you're an adult, you know, in medicine in particular, you got to be able to work through some of the, the red tape that comes up uh, along the way. Yes. I went to Prairie View. So I know about the whole HBCU oh. experience. Yeah. So I know about <laughs> um, trying to grind it out, but I don't regret my decision and I wouldn't be here without going to uh PV. So last question. Yeah. So you, so you got a bun in the oven. If you had to leave one message for your little one, what would it be? Oh, wow. Well, I just had a bun in the oven who's out now five. I have a five week mm-hmm. old baby and a um, two year old, almost two so year leave old. a message so, for um, both of them. So, so, so one won't feel jealous if they come back and listen to this yeah. years from now. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> You know, I I would say that um, certainly, and this is probably true about a lot of us, my path to where I am now is not a straight line. And uh, it didn't exactly happen the way that I thought it would. And, but I'm exactly where I'm supposed to be. And so my advice is, is that things, it's so cliche, but like things work out the way that they're supposed to. And People told me that when I would go through hard times and I, you know, didn't believe them. And then I started to believe them because it actually started to be really true. Um, Like you always, it always just ends up that you get put in the place that you need to be. And whether that's because you become more resilient and you learn how to, to pivot and like still find what you need to find to be able to be successful. Or if it's just this fate thing that like it was supposed to happen that way. And that's how you got in the position that you're in. I don't know. Maybe it's a combination of things, but just to really believe that like when you come up upon hurdles that like this happened for a reason and, and that doesn't mean you like wallow in it. It means you figure out what the next thing is, but it's not, it's not a failure. It happened for a reason. And let's, let's figure out the next move. Okay, that's what's up. So thank you for being on. I'm going to let you off the hot seat so you can go and praise Jerry's throne, shrine, whatever you got in your house, all your cowboys <laughs> Well, here. I'm surprised you didn't hear my baby screaming. She's hungry. So oh, I, I'm going to go feed her. Is what oh, I'm gonna I do. heard her. So, so, so go okay. feed her. But once again, thank you for being on. You're great. Um, y'all make sure to go support her in all of her endeavors. But thank you once again. Thank you so much.